So uh, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Brian Amkraut. I'm the executive director of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, and this is the second uh, lecture of our Tzion Lecture Series. The Tzion Lecture Series marries a commitment to exploring the connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel with critical thinking about Zionism. Uh, we invite you to learn from expert scholars about the history and ideas of Jewish nationalism and the politics and challenges of creating and maintaining a Jewish state. Tzion provides a forum for serious examination of the issues, endeavoring to challenge participants' ideas and opinions while opening the possibility for reaching new and deeper connections and understandings. Tonight's session is titled, Israel, Still Jewish and Democratic? And our presenter tonight is Daron Kalir, clinical professor and director of the LLM program at Cleveland Marshall College of Law at Cleveland State University. Before arriving in Cleveland, Professor Kalir practiced antitrust and other federal litigation law with several prominent New York firms, most notably Skadden Arps, where he served for nearly five years. Professor Kalir was born and raised in Tel Aviv, served in the Israeli Defense Forces for three years before attending the Hebrew University Law School. There he received his LLB cum laude and LLM summa cum laude degrees, taught contracts and jurisprudence as an instructor, and served on the editorial board of the Law Review. Following his studies, Professor Kalir clerked for the Honorable Justice Naor, currently the Vice Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court. While practicing law in Israel, Professor Kalir had the opportunity of serving all three branches of government. He also argued successfully several cases before the Israeli Supreme Court. In 2011, Professor Kalir completed a translation of a book by, Israeli's former chief, by Israel's former Chief Justice, Professor Aram Barak, entitled Proportionality, Constitutional Rights, and Their Limitations. Uh, we're pleased to welcome back Professor Kalir, who will also be joining us on Wednesday afternoon uh, to talk about current events in Israel. Uh, and no stranger to many who've been at Siegel programs for some time, please join me in welcoming Darun Kalir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone, and Chag Sameach. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, I'm still a little bit blown away, actually, by the fact that you, uh, you come in the evening to study about Israel. I mean, that, that fascinates me. That blows my mind. I do it every day. I read uh, the Israeli papers every day. I do it for a living. But uh, to actually come and, and pay, as Marvin said, <laughs> in cash to do that, wow, I'm blown away. So um, I posed a question mark at the end of the title of my um, presentation today is Israel is still a Jewish and democratic state. But before we get to today and the still, we have to start off with the beginning. So the first uh, station of our presentation today will be the past. We'll look at the origins of the notion of Jewish and democratic state, both from historical, political, and legal perspective. Then we'll talk a little bit about the present, the unconventional and unconvenient topic of the Gaza War of 2014. And we'll end uh, with a look at the future, what's ahead. Let's start with historical perspective. And we start, of course, in the beginning. Israel was established on May 15th, 1948. You all know that very well. And the founding document was the Declaration of Independence. What did the Declaration of Independence had to say in terms of the nature of the new country that is just uh, created? It said in the opening words, Be'eret Yisrael kama ama Yehudi. In the land of Israel, the Jewish people was born or was created. So the notion of Jewish is in the very first words of the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel. It's not surprising. It should be that way, but I'm just telling you that it was the same way in the Declaration of Independence. Then the Declaration goes on to say, on the 29th of November, 1947, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution calling for the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel. Jewish state in, um, in Eretz Israel. And later, we hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel. And there are more than 20 references to the notion of Jewish, and more than that, uh, indirectly during the declaration. What term is missing? Remember the title of my lecture today? <laughs> That's right. So Israel is not only a Jewish state, I said, or I put that in the title, I declared that it was also a democratic state. The term democratic does not appear in the Declaration of Independence. It's okay. It does not appear in the American Declaration of Independence either. But we have those nice words from Jefferson. Remember, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by the Creator with some inalienable rights, among those are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The same 
happens in the Israeli Declaration of Independence. The state of Israel will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisioned by the prophets of the Bible. It will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all of its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or gender. Mind you, not just equality, but complete equality. Shivyon is medini gamu, gamu, complete equality. Mind you that the, the founders, the founding fathers, Ben Gurion and others, thought that complete equality is the right measure to treat the minorities in Israel. That was the promise. Um, was it ever fulfilled? I'm not sure. That's going to be um, part of our travel today. So my first question to you is, the Declaration of Independence says that in the land of Israel, in Eretz Israel, we'll establish a Jewish state. What does it mean to have a Jewish state? Majority. 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 Jews. Majority of Jews. Excellent. But why? Oh, I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't ask now. But I've always wondered, why is it, is it is, I, I think Jewish is a religion. Is, is Israel a religious, a Jewish religious state? If you had to plan, if you had to plan a Jewish state, what is a Jewish state? I don't know. I'm asking Good. <laughs> maybe in an hour we'll, we'll get a better idea. I don't understand why it should be a Jewish state. Why is it just a state for the Jewish people? Right. So majority of Jews, I think that's established. Yes. Well, uh, when I think of Jewish, yes. I think of more than a religion. Yes. There are Jews who are very religious. There are Jews who are Jews by birth and culture. That's excellent. And all of you are correct. But I didn't ask you, please forgive me, I didn't ask you what does it mean to be Jewish. It's a bigger question, way above my pay grade. I ask you, if you are the founding fathers of a Jewish state, what would that state be like? There will be a Jewish majority. What else? Please. Yes? Well, it's kind of like, in, in, at least part of it, in what you've set forth, it's being the, um, I don't know what you said about the prophets, but in the way of the prophets, and it will be for equality and justice. And That's the Jewish part? Yes, that's true. Yeah, I agree. Yes, Ilani. Let's say well, Jewish symbols, okay. Jewish language, yes. Hebrew. Oh, uh, my wife said Jewish symbols, Jewish language, um, Jewish majority. She knows. Yeah. Well, Jew, a majority of Jewish representation in the government. Right, a majority of Jews, a majority of Jews in the government. Okay. Um, we can think of a lot of things that a Jewish state would look like. For example, uh, a country governed by the laws of the Torah. Israel is not that country. A Jewish state could conceivably, like we heard earlier, can be comprised of the laws of the Torah, but there are no laws of the Torah in Israel in general. We'll get to the exemption in a second. It can be governed by religious leaders, but Jewish religious leaders, no such thing. It can be governed by religious ideas or ideals, not that either. Um, we have the holidays, and we'll get that in a second. And then we have, as Ilanit mentioned, uh, in the Jewish state, and no one will deny that, we speak Hebrew, we celebrate the Jewish holidays, and we read the Torah, we study the Torah in, in school. Interestingly, uh, a rabbi that just made Aliyah to Israel said something very nice in the paper the other day. He said, there is no longer the Jewish high holiday, just the high holidays in Israel, because you don't have to say. So um, not governed by laws of the Torah. There is an exception. Uh, in 1953, the Israeli government decided and voted the law of the land to be that marriage and divorce in the state of Israel would be based on the laws of the Torah. Um, and that act means that um, if you want to get married in Israel with another Jewish person, you have to go to a rabbi and through a rabbi. And by rabbi, Israeli means orthodox rabbi. No reform, uh, maybe conservative, but mostly uh, orthodox rabbi. Um, if you don't like it, go marry elsewhere. And a lot of Israeli, a growing number of Israeli has been going to Cyprus and South America and um, now by the internet. But um, the laws of marriage and divorce in Israel still is governed by the laws of the Torah. Religious leaders, 
never in the history of Israel did we have a, a religious person as a prime minister. We had several times something very close to that, or promises of religious leaders that, that rose through the ranks. Uh, Aryeh Deli comes to mind, uh, and now Naftali Bennett is a rising star. But uh, generally speaking, we never had a person who wears kippah on a daily basis uh, being the leader of Israel. Although the religious parties have always participated in the uh, government and uh, they're always members of the Knesset and well represented beyond their numbers in Israel. With regards to religious ideas, generally not. We don't believe in the idea that praying to God will help us to fight the Hamas. So we have the IDF, the, five, the fifth largest army in the world. But people who declare that they do nothing else all day other than studying the Torah are exempted from service. We'll get back to that later. This is one of the biggest clashes between the notion of Jewish and democratic. Now, I want to point out uh, something that was said earlier, and I couldn't agree more. Jewish and democratic should be one. There is no reason to have a, a conflict between equality and Judaism. But for my purposes right now, I'm just establishing the two ideas side by side. Remember, it's Jewish and democratic. So um, Yom Kippur is uh, kept voluntarily in Israel. There are no laws, but nobody drives other than the kids who rides their skateboards and razors and, uh, and bicycle all day. Uh, Shabbat, there's no public transportation. Most of the stores are closed, although there is growing um, debate now in Israel whether some malls should be open on Shabbat, away from the cities and so forth. But generally speaking, Shabbat is the formal day of rest. Um, stores are closed. There's no public transportation. We speak the language of Hebrew, the language of the Tanakh, we celebrate the holidays, um, and we study the Torah as a mandatory, mandatory study for K through 12. Um, and there is no that hollowed separation between church and state that we have here in, a, um, in the First Amendment. What is a democratic state? That's something that you should know much better, I guess. What are the features of a democratic state? Voting. Yes. Of course, there's the right, the right to vote. The right to but vote. We continue to have that conflict even in present-day American politics. Yeah, I wish, uh, I wish you'd go to the United States Supreme Court and remind them that, of course, the right to vote. For some reason, they reversed the uh, Sixth Circuit that decided that Ohio should have extended uh, voting rights, and they said no must. But anyway, of course, voting, free, equal, free change of powers. What else other than voting? Equal opportunity for everybody. Equal opportunity, the principle of equality. You can practice your religion. You can practice your religion. That's absolutely proud of a democracy, I agree. So, um, yes, Israel pretty much answered to the preconceived notion of democracy right from the beginning. It held open, free, and equal election in every term. Um, had a strong, strong rule of law. The Supreme Court created a uh, judicial bill of rights. We'll get to that in a second. And a very active Knesset that had a flurry of social regulation, including, of course, universal health care, like anywhere else in the world. Only in America is a big issue. Um, the exception is, if you look at Israel in the first 30 years, from 1948 to 1977, although we held formal, open, free, and democratic election. It was the same party. Um, it was the uh, Avodah Party, which here is uh, Social Democrats, more or less. Uh, and uh, they held in power from 1948 till 1977. One could argue, one could make the argument that if, if the voting goes on every year and for 30 years we have the same party in power. It's not a real democracy. But I'm not getting into this, but this argument has been made. In the first year, however, it's very clear, um, let's say from 48 to 54, that Israel was uh, less of a democracy and more of a tyranny, where the government told you exactly how much to spend, what days to spend it, what you can eat, what you can't eat, because there were huge rations. There was a huge uh, tsena, which is basically what uh, Europe is undergoing now, but on steroids. There were things you could eat on certain days of the week. There were things you couldn't eat on certain days of the week. And by and large, the involvement of the government in your private life was so excessive that when I came to this country and I saw that people are going out on the street for universal health care, I thought they're crazy. I mean, in 1975, uh, when I was alive already, we had stickers on the car saying, you can't drive on Tuesday. Now imagine here in the United States, the government telling people not to drive on Tuesday. I mean, if you think that, uh, you, you know, Obamacare is making uh, the people go onto the street. Yeah, why would they do that? There was no fuel. There was no fuel. Yeah, there was no fuel. 
That's an excellent reason, mostly, and, 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 and that's very interesting. In America, um, and that's digressing, but just for 30 seconds, the Bill of Rights, if you remember, uh, I'm sorry, the Declaration of Independence is basically a Bill of Grievances against the king. And since then, the Americans established a very healthy suspicion towards their government. Why are you doing this? Why are you entering my life? In Israel, it's almost the opposite. The government is held to be the servant of the people, for the people, by the people. They didn't read the Gettysburg Address, but they know that the government basically is functioning for us. So if the government says it's better not to drive on Tuesday, nobody second guesses it. Nobody goes to the street. Nobody uh, goes to the uh, Israeli Supreme Court and said this is unconstitutional. At least in those days. Today, maybe the reality is a bit different. But more generally than not, the Israeli uh, trust their government to, to act on their behalf. Yes, sir. As I read the first uh, line... Oh, sorry. Uh, you make an exception. It reads as though uh, those first 30 years were not free and equal. No, no, no. I just said no, essentially the same people were. No, no, no. I said that essentially the same people were voted in for 30 years, and an argument can be made and has been made that even if the ex the elections are free, equal, and democratic, if you go on and elect the same people for 30 years, this is not a real democracy. But I'm not getting into this today. I'm just saying that this argument has been made that a regularly change of government, like here, Republicans, Democrats, Republicans, Republicans, Democrats, Democrats, that's a good system. But Democrats, 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 30 years, this is not a democracy. That's a claim. Yeah, yeah you can make that argument with, with uh, you know, theorists of social food. Good for them, yeah. Oh, I'm not saying it's better if you change. I'm just saying that one of the main characteristics of a democracy is a regular change of power. That's what I'm saying. It's very, um, very limited. So, so Israel. How many candidates were there during this first? Oh, Menachem Begin stood for election every one of those 29 years until he was elected. He was the head of the opposition for 29 long years, every single time, until he was voted in. That tells you something also about the opposition in Israel, but that's for another day. Mm -hmm. Turning decades, 67 to 77, big things have happened in Israel. First, very good things. The Six-Day War happens. After the Six-Day War, we have a euphoria. Israel is great again, from sea to shining sea, um, the biblical promise, the, the great state of Israel. Um, and a young professor from the Hebrew University by the name of Yeshayahu Leibovitch comes out like that crazy man in, in uh, Kafka's story. It says that God is dead in Nietzsche's story, I'm sorry. And he says, you guys are crazy. We have to return the settlements right away. It will eat us uh, alive. It will divide the country into two. We'll end up totally in a civil war over this. Nobody's listen, listening to him. They're all drunk with power and success. And new settlements starts to establish themselves in the West Bank and Gaza that was just recently um, conquered or liberated, depends on how you look at that. The Yom Kippur War in 1974 leads to Menachem Begin rises. After 29 years, he is elected into power in 1977. Now, in order to form a coalition, in order to have the magical 61 uh, to govern the Israeli Knesset that comprised of 120 people, he sets in coalition with the religious parties, and he needs to pay them something. So what does he pay them with? He paid by military exemptions. The military exemptions until then were reserved to very few people uh, that Ben-Gurion recognized are Elohim. Elohim are the best of the best of the religious um, learners who sat all day and um, in their yeshiva, and according to the Chazonish, the, the person who was their leader at the time, um, held the candle burning. There was a fear that after the Holocaust, the entire edifice of the Israel, of the Jewish Talmud and Mishnah will go away. And so there was a need to preserve this core of geniuses, this Elohim, who will not go to the IDF and they will not get hurt, but they will maintain that fire flaming, that torch flaming. Because of... Um, in a genius move in my mind, Begin took this tiny agreement of 400 and opened it up to thousands and thousands of people. All they needed to do is to declare Torah Tam Omnutam, 
what they mostly do all day is study Torah. That would be enough, that declaration alone, to get a waiver from the IDF. That was done without legislation, without vote of the Knesset, without uh, Supreme Court authorization, just signed a letter. Sorry, we, um, I was asked by Brian specifically not to take questions down, but I promise there will be a special session for Q&A. Then, Camp David come, 1977, uh, um, he's elected, 1978, already Sadat is in uh, the Israeli Knesset in Jerusalem. In 1979, we're signing the first and most substantial peace agreement ever with Egyptian that holds until today, unbelievable. Uh, the Camp David um, agreement. Begin, um, who went to the election saying, Afshal, not a, not a centimeter, not a, not a feat that I will give in, is now giving in the entire island of Sinai, feels very, very uh, bad inside and betrayed, which later leads to deep depression um, and creates this clash counter effect that in return for giving away the entire island of Sinai or peninsula, he's, um, he's putting more and more settle settlements in the West Bank and Gaza. Now, how is that relates to Jewish and democratic? From the settlers' perspective, most of them, most of them are very religious people who sees the settlement's enterprise as a promise from God and see the land of Yehuda Shimon, Judea and Samaria, as they're called by, uh, in Israel, they're not called the West Bank. They see that as the original biblical land that David went in and Shlomo and so on and so forth. This is their view. And in their writings, then and now, you can see the notion of Medinat Yehuda, the state of Jehuda, which is different than what they call the land of Tel Aviv, or the land of Israel as we know that. It's a religious state with religious leaders, religious law, religious ideas that governs, and it's separate and apart from um, the rest of the country. Today, the... Um, so the effect of 1967 uh, to 1977, this crazy decade, if you will, led to a lot more establishment of settlements. And today the number of settlements have mushroomed from three, four, five back then to around 120. The number of settlers went to from 23,000 and change at the end of Begin's reign in 1948, which consists of less than half a percent or so of the Israeli population to a staggering 360,000 today, according to the most recent numbers that are confined to 2013, which comprise about 4.4% of the Israeli population. According to a uh, recent cost estimated by Haaretz, it cost about $800 million to the Israeli taxpayer to maintain the enterprise. And although they consist of less than 5% of the Israeli population, uh, the settler holds major political power and a center of contention with American administrations for quite some time. So this is the rise, if you will, of the more religious faction um, in Israel since uh, 67. On the other hand, that same uh, decade fostered a lot more democracy. First of all, we had the first change in power, as, as we saw in 1977. And then, um, we had economic boom, which led to economic bust, which led to economic crisis of the mid 80s that had uh, saw Israel in a 800% a year annual inflation rate, which was crazy. And the shekel was replaced with new Israeli shekel, which if you ever wonder why you have to write NIS and not just shekel when you write the number, because that was a thousand old shekels. Imagine, imagine that the dollar will be so worthless that in one night, a thousand dollars would be one dollar. Just think about it, that you have to go to, to buy uh, milk and bread and it's seven dollars, it's seven thousand dollars. It's not even worth the money almost that it's written on. Uh, so, um, but the shekel today is one of the strongest um, currencies in the world. In fact, in recent years, it outperformed the dollar. If you want to, you know, <laughs> invest in Israeli bonds. Um, Less government-based, more market-based economy. As I told you, it used to be the case that the government told you what to eat, what not to eat, when to drive, when not to drive. Today, Israel is based more on market economy, which led to what you all know today as the startup nation. Startup nation, we have Google, Cisco, Microsoft, Intel, eBay, all have R&D uh, centers in Israel. 
we or Israel is the leading force foreign issuer on the Nasdaq. It means that of all the countries in the world outside the United States, Israel is the leader in uh, issuing um, stocks on the Nasdaq. It's a leading per capita venture capitalist in the entire world in investment. Teva is the world number one generic pharmaceutical company. Um, and it all starts with the military, if you read Dan Sinur's um, book under the same name, The Startup Nation. But recent unrest in Israel has revealed that less than 10% of Israeli young um, are enjoying this uh, startup nation profits. And so the social arrest, unrest began. There was growing gaps between rich and poor, between people who made it, who people who started to uh, travel to Europe twice a year to do skiing and uh, had their own home and two cars, sort of the American dreams, versus the average Israeli family that struggles to even uh, rent one car and rent an apartment in Tel Aviv. So those growing gaps led eventually to an explosion in social unrest that saw over a half a million people on the streets of Tel Aviv two summers ago. If you think about it, it's like seeing 19 million people marching over Washington. That's the ratio. It's just unbelievable. It's the largest um, social demonstration ever, ever in the history of Israel. If we look politically then at the idea of Jewish and democratic state, what do we see? We see that we had a series of leaders since 1948, and if you look, uh, other than the few two years of Moshe Sharet between 54 and 55, it was Ben Gurion's reign from 48 to 63, unimaginable 15 years, and then Levi Eshkol, who ran us through the um, uh, Six Day War, and Golda Meir, which you all know very well, and then Itzhak Rabin. Before we had Menachem Begin, from 48 to 77, we have a list of white. European secular people that did see Israel as a Jewish state, as a prime, a very important notion, but did not, did not think of that in terms of religion. They did not wear kippah as, as a daily basis. They did not, uh, they were not Shomrei Mitzvot. Um, they did pander to the Jewish or the religious vote, so they, um, of course, on Shabbat tried to um, never hold official meetings and not to drive on Shabbat. But these were secular people who brought the secular notion uh, to Israel as, as I grew to understand it and, and love it, by the way, um, which is still has yet to come to the United States. In most times, when you speak of Jewish in the United States, it's less of a cultural Jewish and much more of a religion Jewish. If you want to, by and large, enroll your kids in a Jewish day school, it means that they will first will say Modeani, then they will wear kippah most of the day, then will hold prayers, and that's the light version. On the upper version, they will separate boys and girls and will be frum and will not will eat kosher all day. So, and that's. And that's, again, in the United States, the notion of a Jewish day school. In Israel, all the schools are, are Jewish, quote unquote, and all the schools uh, learn Torah as a daily manner. But we never wore a kippah, not once. We never prayed. Uh, we never kept kosher, um, although most food in Israel by default almost was kosher. So it's important to understand in the first 30 years, the notion of Jewish was very strongly and proudly Jewish as a culture, Jewish as a language, Jewish as a um, environmental notion, but not Jewish as a religion per se. And again, it comes to a little bit of a um, beautiful synergy in the holidays. We do celebrate Pesach and, and Yom Kippur, of course, uh, everybody fast and so forth, but out of respect to the culture and out of respect to the tradition and not that much of because of religious notions and it's not accompanied by prayer uh, mostly um, and going to shul but mostly um, celebration around the home you know the f favorite internet meme um, they they try to kill us we want let's eat that's basically the israeli uh, notion of most most of the holiday um, a change was perceived in 1977 when menachem begin who waited patiently finally rose to power and he 
um, not only created this coalition with the religious people, but starting to be seen around more and more wearing kippah, uh, spoke more and more about his Jewish roots, um, and so forth, and, and really brought home the idea that uh, religion can play a much more important role. Gush Emunim, the settlement movements, were uh, created under his watch and flourished under his watch uh, with a uh, blessing from the government, who really closed its eyes when a lot of um, illegal um, acts were made. In 1979, 5,000 Arab villagers brought a um, petition to the Israeli Supreme Court, we'll talk about it in a second, when they realized that this whole Itnachalut thing, this whole settler movement, is not going to be in isolated points, dots on the map here and there with 30, 50, 60 people. It's actually a movement. It's starting to emerge. And they went to the Supreme Court and say, stop. According to international law, you can't do that. Let's see what the Supreme Court did in two minutes. But that happened under Begin's watch in 1979. Um, um, we then see again an exchange of Shamir and Paris and Shamir and Rabin and Paris and all of this um, exchange is still with people that did not see religion, the Jewish religion as an important stage. The murder of Yitzhak Rabin in 1995 marked a huge point of difference in that. Rabin was murdered by a religious student, Igal Amir, who wore a kippah while shooting Rabin in the back. Um, and he did that in his mind because Rabin betrayed the religion and the religious idea of giving away the holy lands or parts of the holy land. And I'm saying holy lands in quotation mark because it was holy in, in Igal Amir's mind so much that he could murder a prime minister for that. It didn't occur to him that maybe uh, human life is more holy than any piece of land. But without debating this point, it's important that you understand that the murder of the prime minister of Israel was based on religious ground, much like the murder a year before, or the massacre a year before in Me'arat HaMachpelah, um, in Hebron by Baruch Goldstein, an American who made Aliyah to Israel and it was a huge Kahana supporter, was done on religious ground. He said that people cannot, uh, people, Muslims cannot pray in the Jewish Me'arat uh, in the tome of the, I can't remember what it's called, in a second we'll get to that, uh, murdering 29 um, mourners and uh, injuring 126 people because they were not Jewish and praying in what he considered to be a holy site for the Jews. So those murders in 1994, which led then to the murder of Rabin in 1995, were done on religious ground. And that's the first time that their religious um, idea and their religious people start to make a mark on a national level in terms of uh, asserting their ideas of the Israeli uh, political landscape. Benjamin Netanyahu harnessed that. He um, stood um, in some of those in some of those uh, public demonstrations that showed Rabin wearing an SS garb and otherwise. And um, he's a great speaker, he's a good public speaker. And he inflamed the listeners by saying that giving away uh, parts of the Israeli land is against um, everything that is in our heritage. And carried by that sentiment, he actually won which is unthinkable. He won the election right after Rabin's uh, murder in 1996. Um, there was also a disillusion, and it's very important to understand, that Rabin tried to bring in the Oslo Agreement that looked like a huge failure with the Second Intifada um, and the events that happened afterwards. Netanyahu took that into account, and he came up with the idea in his first uh, tenure of peace and security, Shalom v'bitachon. Uh, nothing like that will happen with me. I will not give away land and there will be no war. And both things actually happened. He did not give away land and there wasn't much war. Although he signed the Y agreements, it, will never, it was never implemented. Ehud Barak came into power in 1999 like a meteor, came and went, because he too promised the exact same idea that Rabin promised. We can settle this. We can end this dispute with the Arabs once and for all. He goes to Camp David, he leans on Yasser Arafat, and nothing happens. Again, an intifada breaks when Arik Sharon goes up to the Temple Mount, and immediately Arik Sharon is voted into Prime Minister. Arik Sharon then sees from his famous saying was, uh, 
דברים שרואים מכאן לא רואים משם. Now that I'm prime minister, I'm seeing new things that I've never seen before. And he gives away Gaza only to be um, struck back by uh, thousands of Hamas rockets. Um, and then he gets into a coma, Umert. gets into power, the second Lebanon war, and then we have Benjamin Netanyahu, who's not only ruling from 2009 until now, but there is no, at least in the near future, any leader that suggests to replace him. Now let's look at the um, legal perspective. Um, we saw the historical perspective, we saw the prime minister perspective, but how did Israel fare as a Jewish and democratic state legally? So, we have the Supreme Court of Israel, and it's a beautiful building, as you can all see. I hope some of you can see. It's one of the most beautiful buildings in all of Israel. And if you haven't done so, I strongly urge you, when you go next time to Jerusalem, go and visit the Supreme Court. It's open to the public. There are guided tours in Hebrew and in English, and it's a lot of fun. So, please go. Um, the, uh, anybody been, anyone been to the Israeli Supreme Court? Oh, nice. You were there, Dana. We went together. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> um, so we talked about the Israeli uh, Declaration of Independence. And although it had very legal su significance, it carries no legal authority. That, again, is not unusual. If you think about uh, the um, right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness here in the United States, it's not that you can get into a court and knock on the judge's door and say, hey, um, I haven't quite acquired my right to pursuit for uh, happiness, I'm not very happy. Can you give me some damages? That's not going to happen. Uh, so the Declaration of Independence in and of itself is um, a legal document of some significance, but carries no legal authority. So the Supreme Court, citing liberally, by the way, from the United States Supreme Court, established a judge-made bill of rights, which included the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, and the freedom of occupation. You have to realize, this is nothing short of fantastic. When I studied that in Israel at the time, it looked naturally to me. All judges just declare one day out of thin air that the right of the freedom of speech is at the heart of democracy and cite in, you know, in, for that proposition. They cite Holmes and they cite Brandeis, although Holmes and Brandeis are not members of the Israeli Supreme Court. But the guy who wrote it, Simon Agrinet, actually went to law school in Chicago. And he studied all that. He was an American who made Aliyah. And when he came to write the seminal decision on freedom of speech in Israel, there were no precedents in Israel. So he cites Holmes and he cites uh, Brandeis and, and everybody's happy. So now Israel has all those great Bill of Rights, but no Knesset legislation on the issue. Israel also did not have judicial review mo most of its time. In 1979, as I said, the um, Arab, um, the Arab, original, if you want to call them, inhibitants um, of Alon Moray, that's a new settlement that was established by the Begin um, regime, filed a petition with the Israeli Supreme Court saying, whoa, 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 let's stop it right now while it's still young. You may establish some temporary settlements in an occupied territory for military reasons, but we don't see any military reason to have those people come and, and take our land, take our um, groves and, um, and create their own um, city there. What do you think the Israeli Supreme Court did? Shockingly, it accepted the petition. What? Yes, the Israeli Supreme Court did great. Justice Landoy writing that is fully aware that his decision will be interpreted as some as a political maneuver and by others as a cynic use of um, judicial power or grab of judicial power, writes that according to the Geneva Convention, there is no reason to establish a city um, in, the, um, in the occupied territories. You think that happened? No. A series of Supreme Court decisions since then uh, did not really matter to the Israeli government. And Elon Moray stands today uh, proudly uh, as one of the largest settlements in the, in the occupied territories, as, as many others are. But at least the Supreme Court has this dead letter law of the 1979 Elon Moray Supreme Court case. Um, then the um, series of wrestler cases challenged, wrestler was the name of the petitioners. Uh, he was an attorney. And he was also an IDF officer who filed a petition saying, 
It's not fair that I'm going to Miluim to reserve service 30 days every year while my friend here, Joshua, who studies all day in, uh, uh, in Torah, uh, never goes. And in, in fact, he never served. He never went to the three years. He doesn't go to reserve. How is that equal? And the Supreme Court, you have to see this, a series of decisions. It's funny. Every time gives him the red tape. Uh, no, come next time. No, we're not sure about it. No, we're not sure wh why you have standing here. Um, and, and the Israeli Supreme Court uh, cannot basically help. In 1992, all that has changed. In 1992, the Israeli Knesset enacted the basic law, human dignity and liberty. Again, the basic law, human dignity and liberty, that's one of the most important laws Israel ever enacted and arguably the most important law. That law defines Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. Jewish and democratic state. Uh, it also turns the spirit of the principles set forth in the Declaration of Independence to be binding law. Now, if you ask me as an attorney, and professor of law, what does the spirit of the principles set forth in the declaration mean? I will tell you exactly what you think right now. I have no clue. But it's nice, the spirit of the principle. Um, and then it allows the Supreme Court for the first time to confer the power of judicial review over Knesset legislation. How did the Supreme Court understand the basic law, human dignity and liberty to do that? It's amazing. Again, the Supreme Court of Israel cites liberty from, uh, from an 1803 case here in the United States, Marbury v. Medicine, by which uh, Chief Justice Marshall adopted the power of judicial review and liberally citing from this case as if Chief Justice Marshall is a Jewish guy sitting in Beersheba and, um, and basically adopting the power of judicial review saying, if we have basic law of human liberty and dignity, we also have judicial review. Now, equality is not mentioned specifically in that basic law. But as we saw for the Supreme Court, this is not a big problem. Uh, the, the fact that things are not written in the law does not mean much because Aharon Barak, which is really a superpower in terms of judicial brain, is sitting as ch Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And it's nothing short of a miracle that at the time that this law was enacted, the brightest Chief Justice we've ever had is sitting um, presiding over the court. Now, one word about the Jewish and democratic state. We saw until 1992 that Israel was Jewish. We saw until 1992 that Israel was democratic. But what does it mean to be Jewish and democratic at the same time? A lot of questions rose and tons of ink was poured over the following question. Can uh, someone work on Shabbat? On the one hand, it's a Jewish value not to work on Shabbat. On the other hand, it's a democratic value to work whenever you want. Serving in the army, uh, on the one hand, there is this agreement that Jews do not, you know, religious people want to maintain this flame going. On the other hand, as a, as a part of a democracy, everybody has to serve in the army. Um, and the questions went on and on. Public transportation on Shabbat, um, having um, um, business open in Yom Kippur. There, there were tons of questions, and the Israeli government started to panic, so they enacted another law, an adjacent law, saying it's called the freedom of occupation, saying that with regards to kosher food, nothing can be done. So again, to appease the religious factions in the government, there is a basic law right adjacent to the human dignity and liberty law that says, whatever you guys decide, don't touch kosher food, uh, and it's not allowed to have kosher. Um, to, to, you know, to enacted laws against kosher, against kashrut. So what did the Supreme Court d do since 1992 with this new prized power? The Supreme Court recognized equality as a right under certain circumstances. So although equality is not written into the law, um, equality should be recognized in cases where a lack of equality may hurt someone's human dignity. And that means that women can serve in religious councils. And that means that the religious uh, parties cannot take away the uh, kashrut authorization from a restaurant because that restaurant also happens to show uh, belly dancing. And there were a series of decisions that say that in the clash between uh, religion and um, and democracy, democracy should prevail. As Haron Barak is sitting in justice, um, he has uh, justice alone to his side, and justice alone is a rabbi and a key powering, extremely Jewish person who is br equally brilliant to him. 
And Aharon Barak says, what does Jewish and democratic mean? It means, and I think it was alluded to earlier, uh, that Jewish values should be abstracted to the highest level so they will be the universal Jewish values as envisioned by those prophets. Equality, justice, tzedek tzedek tildof, you remember? Justice you will seek, and so forth. And when it comes to this, then those Jewish values merge and fuse into democracy. On the other hand, just as Elon said, nonsense. They could have just written democracy if that was their intention. They wrote Jewish and democracy for a reason. And more than that, they prefaced Jewish to democracy to make sure that there is an order of importance here. First you start with the Jewish, and then if there's any room left, democracy. So they, those guys, I mean, they were two giants of the law, and I wish some of you could read Hebrew in that level of Israel Supreme Court to just read some of those decisions that came out in those days of those two giants fighting the idea of Jewish and democratic. One says it's a fusion, one says could not be further than the truth. It's only Jewish, and the democratic is ve and democratic, just to, should be, uh, in, case, in case you have that to doubt, he says, between two Jews Jewish interpretation, choose the more democratic one. That's basically his idea. Um, so um, basically, Barack's, um, although Barack's view more or less prevailed, I'm saying more or less, in terms of impact, the Supreme Court had very little impact since 1992. It did say that private prisons, for example, violate human dignity. So Israel was about to open private prisons or private privately held, privately run prisons like they're doing here. 93% of the state prisons in America are privately run. And the Israeli Supreme Court says no. If someone profits from more and more prisoners, that's against human dignity. That does not, can't happen in a democracy. And my judge, Justice Naor, that uh, Brian kindly mentioned earlier, and she'll be stepping into the role of Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court in a few days in January, uh, she wrote, it's also a part of our legal system. If our legal system maintains that prosecution can be only done by the state prosecution, we can't just hire people and say, okay, you prosecute, you prosecute. And if the judges are only made by state appointed judges, then the prison system should also be a part of this arc. It can be that we will just outsource a part of the ju judicial system. So, um, and they declared that that initiative by the Knesset is simply unconstitutional. And there's a huge out uproar in the Knesset, <laughs> primarily because, and I'm sorry to say that, but I do say it openly here, most Knesset members in Israel don't read Supreme Court cases. So they didn't even know that the Israeli Supreme Court has undertaken itself the right for judicial review. They were utterly in shock when they were told by their uh, judicial advisors that this law cannot get into effect. They said, who is this the Supreme Court? And if you think that this is a joke, listen to a case that happened a few days ago in Israel, we'll get to that in a minute, that elicited the exact same responses from the Knesset. Exact same response a few days ago. Okay, with regard to the idea of exemption, um, in 2012, finally, finally, the Israeli Supreme Court listened to the Ressler number seven, I think, petition and says that the, um, sell the settlement cannot stand. In 1948, to remind you, there were only candle in the wind, very few religious elite, Elohim, who were exempted. But in 2010, that very few has mushroomed into 67,000 exemptions. 67,000. If, ben, if you know, Ben Gurion would come to life, he would be like, whoa, I, that's totally not what I meant. 67,000 is more than the entire IDF in, uh, in 1948. Between 85 post Begin um, and 98, there was an increase of 237 in the number of exemption, while the total number of religious people in Israel rose by 0.1%. So you can imagine that something, the math just done, doesn't add up. Either um, a brand new line of geniuses uh, arrived in the world, or just more and more and more people declare themselves to be Toratam Omnutam, people who are only dealing with the Torah 24 hours a day day and therefore should be exempted. The Supreme Court says you can't do that. You can't exempt them by law. And then again, an outrage breaks. The Knesset said, what do you want us to do? To start going home to home and, and recruit them? We don't even have enough military force, uh, military police, to go home to home uh, door to door in Bnei Brak and Jerusalem and, and start to actually enlist it. So what happens? Nothing. Nothing. 2012, the Supreme Court says it's unconstitutional. Since then, not one single uh, Haredi was, was uh, 
uh, enlisted, although uh, my wife Erilani says that 600 were. So, yeah, out of the 67,000, one from me was, was perhaps um, recorded. And, and why? Because some of them really understand that serving in the IDF is a key to success. Other than the Arabs in Israel, the ultra-religious are the poorest, poorest population in Israel. And the reason that they are so poor is that they don't learn in school math and computers and English, and they don't serve in the army. So later jobs that are usually open to army grads are not open to them. And, and so it's just a perpetual cycle of, of poverty. And so very few of them understand every year that maybe it's in their benefit to actually go and serve in the army, but that's another thing. Okay, enough with going down memory lane. Um, let's talk a little bit about today. And in five minutes, I know you've got to eat. So it'll be a very short um, uh, today section. This summer, we had 50 days of fighting between July and August. Uh, and we've taught Sukeitan or protective edge. Protective edge has nothing to do with Sukeitan, which is more like a solid rock. And if you think of uh, Viagra or other uh, means of, um, you know, uh, some dysfunction for those names, you're probably right because that most of the names of the Israeli military um, um, exercises in, in the summers are calling the exact same names and someone did a research, ran a research of that and uh, also uh, a quiz about what will be the next name but that's not funny I, I'm sorry it shouldn't be funny any event uh, over 4,500 rockets were launched from Gaza to Israel by the Hamas thanks to Iron Dome um, we only said only have 70 people dead 63 of them were IDF people that had killed in action that means that only seven civilians were had died throughout the war 126 wounded over 875 rockets I, I thought it's an interesting statistic that I learned while preparing for this lecture fell in Gaza their own their own that shows the, the sophistication level of the uh, Hamas rockets um, on our side Israel launched uh, 6,200 and change rockets, no Iron Dome there, uh, 2,100 casualties. Um, according to different estimates, and they are varied, about 45 of them were terrorists uh, and about 500 children were killed. Currently, uh, there's no ceasefire. Um, uh, there is a ceasefire, I'm sorry, but there's no solution to the conflict, which means, in essence, that unless great changes will take place. It will happen again next summer and the summer after that and the summer after that. Now, why do I bring all those statistics to a Jewish and democratic state lecture? It's because what happened in Israel before and during the war. But before the war, um, and I remind you again about the, the murders that were committed by religious people in Israel previously, on the name of the Jewish religion, the Rabin murder and the um, Hebron uh, Tomb of the Patriarch uh, massacre. In response to the kidnapping of the three yeshiva buchers, the, a 16-year-old boy, Muhammad al Hader, was kidnapped, bitten, and burned alive in the Jerusalem forest. The uh, suspect, Yosef Ben Chaim, a, a religious person who works in an optical store in Jerusalem, uh, declared, I'm the Messiah, as soon as he entered the court. Now, again, this murder was done in his mind because God has to revenge the murder of the three Yeshiva Buchel. Now, during the war, there were several attempts to silent protests in Israel. In bar -Ilan University, and if the name bar -Ilan University rings a bell, that's exactly the place and the law faculty from which uh, Igal Amir came. So one of the professors in that law school sends an email to his uh, students saying, I know you're very busy because of the war, so I'm willing to postpone the, pa the paper. I'm also hoping that peace and comfort will come to casualties on both sides. That term, casualties on both sides, lend him with a disciplinary um, uh, oh, sorry. Disciplinary um, process in front of the uh, dean, and the dean requires him to publicly apologize, which he does not do. But that's that's what happens. Uh, a peaceful demonstration in Tel Aviv is met with death to Arabs and death to leftists uh, and beatings, where the police, according to reports, is stand, standing idly by. Gilal Magor, Israel's first theater lady, think of the Israel's Meryl Strip canceled the show after she received death threats because she too um, expressed some sympathy to the parents of, the, uh, of Muhammad al-Hadr, the 16-year-old uh, boy who was burned alive. 
Um, and then comedian Orna Banai fired. And I'm giving you all those examples just because you understand what happened during the war. She's a very famous comedian in Israel. Um, she was a spokesperson for a cruise ship in Israel. Um, she was fired because she said something about, again, expressing empathy to both sides. And perhaps the most astonishing thing, Haaretz hires a bodyguard for his uh, Gidon Levy, a very leftist um, op-ed writer who writes during the war Haraim Latais, the worst, uh, are going to um, to the Jets, which is the, of course, a play on words in Israel. We say Atuvim Latais, the best should go to the um, to fly the Jets. His claim is that without an anti-aircraft missiles and without an air force, basically the Hamas, uh, what the Israeli air force is doing is is playing video games. And so to to bomb all those areas in Gaza um, uh, is is just a video game and, and should not be allowed. Uh, if, and if Israel wants to bomb in Gaza, it should walk in and do so. That lands in with such a serious death threats. I'm not saying that he's right, by the way. I'm not suggesting that he's right. Um, a series of death threats that he's now walking along with uh, bodyguard. And Zehev Sternal, who's a world-renowned um, expert on, on uh, fascism, says that today, in today's Israel, to express any remorse or regret or empathy to victims of both sides is an act of treason, quote unquote. And he should know because a settler has planted a bomb uh, next to his door several years ago and he's still wounded from that. Um, on other news, the Supreme Court strikes down for the second time an attempt by the Knesset to mass jail all West Africans refugees in Israel. Um, they came en masse and Israel, instead of conducting individual hearings and asylum hearings as done here, simply put them all in jail and uh, hope for the best. Supreme Court said, said that they can jail them for three times and then deport them. Supreme Court says you can't do that. According to international and Israeli law, you can't just mass jail people whose only crime was coming to Israel to seek refuge. So the Knesset amend that says, okay, we'll jail them only for one year. Supreme Court strikes it again, says, no, you can't jail people whose only crime is coming to Israel to seek refuge. I hope you, Knesset, listens this time. In response, Minister of Israel of the Interior, Gidon Sao, and this happens this week. We're not talking 12 years ago when the Supreme Court, or in 92, 20 years ago when the Supreme Court announced the, um, his power for judicial review. This week, uh, it says the Supreme Court should not even sit on immigration cases. It's not the business of the Supreme Court. That's the response of an Israeli minister to an Israeli Supreme Court decision. They should not deal with immigration issues. So what do we have in summary? Um, in summary, we have in Israel a clash between very strong democratic uh, ideals and by now, since 48, um, a tradition. So a strong democratic tradition, a strong democratic ideals that sets forth the notion of equality and equal rights and human dignity and fair election and equal representation. But we also have emerging voices of Jewish law in the most extreme interpretation of the term, saying that since God has promised us the land, any movement towards peace means a betrayal of God and therefore is worth and justifies murder. And we have strong um, and loud uh, minority who claims that voices of discussion should be uh, shushed, if not beaten down. And finally, we have forces inside the Israeli government that calls for um, limiting the Supreme Court power. So this, these are very worrisome trends. And this is something that we should think about as we're looking ahead in Israel and considering whether it can maintain its status as a Jewish and democratic state. Thank you very much for listening. Please enjoy the dinner and we'll come to Q&A later.